Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nucleus Investment Insights. Topic of discussion for, for today is the commodity blow off. On the agenda, we'll analyze the situation in commodities and we'll look at the anatomy of the blow off. Next, we'll delve into the interaction of commodities and the effectiveness of the sanctions against Russia. We'll look at the supply elasticity and the demand destruction. Next, we'll look at the risks of the unfolding war. So we'll look at the financial risks, recession risks, supply chain and retaliation risks. Then we'll discuss uh, why this is all about the Fed again. And of course, as always, we'll cover the investment implications at the end. My name's Sam Kerr, and I'm the Senior Financial Advisor at Nucleus Wealth. Today, as always, we have Damien Klassen. He's the Head of Investments, and he'll give us his expert insights on the unfolding situation. Damien, welcome. Thanks for joining us, as always. Thanks, Sam. Excellent. And uh, we also have the Chief Strategist at Nucleus Wealth, Dave, David Llewellyn Smith, uh, who will give us his unique macro business perspective. G'day, Dave. How are you going? Good, thanks, Sam. Great to be here. Good to hear. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be an interesting discussion today. Uh, just a quick reminder before we get started, if you enjoy our content, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and click the bell below to be notified when we go live or have a new episode recorded. Alternatively, follow us on your preferred podcast platform. Our show is available on all the majors. And for those of you listening in live today, feel free to drop your questions in the YouTube live stream chat and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. So now we've got that little bit of housekeeping out of the way, we'll get into it. So uh, Damien, I'll hand it over to you to get us started. Yeah, sure. So I uh, wanted to show a quick map, a couple of maps, just map from where we were last week uh, this time and, and a map from where we are this week. And and so I guess just, um, you know, just, we wanted to run through, I guess, the situation where we are in, in the war. And so it hasn't changed a lot over, over that week. It's actually, you know, I, I think the change between day one and day seven was 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 pretty significant. Uh, the change between day seven and day 14 has, has been a lot less. So, you know, it certainly looks like um, uh, Russia's a bit more bogged down now. But uh, I think there's probably still not a lot of um, expectation that, that uh, the Ukraine is... Um, is going to win the war. It's, it's more about how difficult they can make it and, and how soon they can sort of, uh, they, they could certainly try and get um, Russia to the to the negotiating table if possible. But um, Dave, maybe you might have, you obviously blog about this every day. And, and, and uh, so, you know, if you want to give a quick, quick rundown, I guess, how you're seeing it. Mm. Well, it's, it's, It's a difficult situation, isn't it? Uh, we're surrounded by the fog of war and the day-to-day -day movements <clears throat> in terms of who's winning and who's losing are probably not what matters most. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. What is probably more important is the context in which it, this is transpiring. That is, you know, a great power in Russia looking to muscle out into a satellite state and uh, impose its will uh, in, a, in a sense that gives it a strategic buffer. Um, by that, I mean, it's looking to create uh, a, a geopolitical circumstance where it doesn't need to be quite so afraid of the West um, turning Ukraine into a liberal democracy armed with missiles that could reach Moscow in five minutes. Uh, now, this is not a particularly popular narrative in Western media, because naturally we're all kind of empathetic with what's happening to the Ukrainian people. And as well, you know, kind of strategic thinking and geopolitics doesn't play particularly well in the press because it's, it's called realism. Uh, but in it, it, that's that has kind of more implication as a school of thought in this area than just you know the sort of standard sense of of pragmatism. And in the realist school of thought, here Russia is simply doing what any great power would do, and that is to try and uh, secure itself from uh, foreign threats. Now, uh, if you if you look at in terms of what's transpiring. Uh, at the moment in Ukraine. So we have 
Obviously, Russia a bit bogged down. It's very early in, in its incursion, so I wouldn't draw too many conclusions, but uh, it is bogged down. And at the same time, you have Kiev, I think, pretty clearly winning the global propaganda war, uh, which is uh, kind of channeling into, uh, I think, a certain amount of irrationality in geostrategic terms that is driving US policy. And Europe is a bit of a meat in the sandwich in this. Uh, so uh, the fact that Ukraine is kind of winning the propaganda war and the US is a little bit, I think, biased against Russia in some senses, uh, uh, you know, understandably so, but in other kind of pragmatic or realist terms, not at all means that uh, we've got ourselves into a very, very serious pickle in Ukraine. Um, the various outcomes are not very good. Now, hopefully what happens here is, uh, you know, Putin has been very, very clear really since 2013 about what he wants to see in Ukraine and in this entire uh, sort of Western buffer zone on the Russian border. Um, where he's been, he's he's gritted gritted his teeth as NATO has moved east, uh, but he's also made clear that there are certain lines, of, red lines, if you like, that Russia is not prepared to countenance. One of them was that Ukraine becomes part of NATO and the EU and a liberal democracy on its border. Uh, he's been quite clear about that for nearly a decade, uh, and yet the Ukrainians who obviously wants self-determination, uh, have spent a lot of time kind of uh, in conversation with the US about defying Putin's wishes. Uh, and so where do we go from here? If the Ukrainians succeed in holding the Russians at bay to some extent, and this turns into uh, something that gets really bogged down, I don't see a good outcome for the Ukrainians. Like, even if they are armed by the West and, and it turns into an insurgency of sorts or they manage to simply turn it into a, you know, a long quagmire for Russia, I think Russia ends up doubling down here and uh, they end up levelling Ukraine. Uh, that's if that's kind of where we're at right now is, you know, Hopefully there's an off ramp for Putin here before we get to that stage. We've seen some concessions from Ukraine in the last few days uh, about the possibility of, of sort of more or less declaring themselves neutral, never joining NATO. Some of, some of the demands that Putin's made are being met by the Ukrainians, but they're still holding out on things like territory. They won't give up the Donbass. They still won't uh, concede even Crimea. Uh, and so, you know, there's still a large gap between the way that, that the Ukrainian leadership is thinking and, and probably the US leadership is thinking and the way that Russia is thinking. And so, <clears throat> although in these kind of circumstances, we get these constant outbreaks of both war and then diplomacy, uh, at this stage, you know, you can expect that to continue. And hopefully there is an off ramp for Putin in which he, you know, Ukraine more or less declares its independence. It will never become a Western state. Uh, you know, there'll be some sort of contractual binding of that. Russia withdraws to the Donbass. Crimea becomes part of Russia or independent, just as the Donbass does. And the Russians withdraw, and there are no new missiles kind of deployed through the Ukraine to threaten Moscow. Now, that's, that's the best case outcome here, but we're a long way from that at this point. Uh, it's very difficult to put probabilities on this. Um, both sides have made a lot of mistakes over a long period of time to get us into the, into this position. Uh, arguably, this war should never have happened if, if the US had been a little less uh, perhaps prejudicial towards Russia over the last decade. Uh, a little bit less sentimental, then I don't think that they would have necessarily backed the Orange Revolution. Um, and, you know, at least we might have reached a point where 
Russia's insecurities would have been factored into strategic settings and we could have uh, escaped some of the worst case, out, worst case outcomes. But we're not there now. And so the probabilities of where we end up insurgency and Russian uh, <clears throat> intensification, like they are not firing their big guns yet, uh, and they could if Ukraine either A, bogs them down, or B, starts to even win to some extent, being armed by the West. Like, for instance, we've seen over the last week the possibility of Polish MiGs being deployed in Ukraine, uh, and in which case, you know, some of the bogged down areas of Russian Russian uh, invasion, you know, could get really get smashed, um, like the 60 kilometre long uh, convoy, you know, approaching Kiev. If you unleashed aircraft upon that, for instance, uh, then you would have all sorts of shit hitting the fan. Uh, so we're, we're in a very dangerous uh, position. Um, I would say, unfortunately, my view at this point is the base case is Ukraine is not going to come out of this very well. But I, it's so fluid that I wouldn't say that, that, that that's a high probability base case. And I'm hoping the off ramp is, you know, also a decent probability. But the third, I guess the final dimension of where we're at in terms of this discussion in particular is that now that the uh, economic and monetary sanctions have been unleashed, they're going to be very, very difficult to unwind. Uh, even if we get to the best case outcomes, uh, it's going to be very tough for the US to back down from any of the sanctions they put on. Same with Europe. Uh, you know, as and, a, and as plus a, a lot of the company sanctions, it's not like um, of course you know, they're going to turn around. Like a lot of these companies no. have said, okay, I'm leaving this country or I'm not doing it. They're like, well, I'm not going That's back right. just because you've changed your exactly mind. Exactly right. And, yeah. and I would use as an analogy, you know, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis where... Uh, you know, there are some similarities, obviously, with a great power fairly threatened on its doorstep. It was probably handled better by Khrushchev and Kennedy uh, than the current leaderships. Uh, but, it, you know, we got a peaceful outcome, in a sense, from that um, particular um, shirt fronting of great powers. But the sanction regimes that came into place then are still in place today. Yeah. Right. So... Once these regimes are put in place, they're very difficult to remove, and especially so when you get such uncertain outcomes in this in the contested geopolitical area. So, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm not overly optimistic that it will end well in terms of, uh, you know, where Ukraine's headed. Hmm. And I think the sanction regime is something that you can uh, take to the bank. Yes. Yes. So that's sort of that brings us back to. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about it as we go on, but I guess that's sort of uh, you know, a geopolitical overview. And then, so um, yeah, and we've spoken a little bit about the sanctions. So I guess the background, roughly, is that uh, both Russia and Ukraine are both big suppliers of wheat. Um, the Ukraine's got a, got a lot of iron ore. Uh, Russia has a fair bit as well. And um, and Russia's got um, truckloads of energy, both coal uh, and gas and oil. So uh, mainly, it's mainly exporting though uh, the oil, the oil and the uh, and the gas. And so that means that what we're seeing is is commodity prices have all shot higher. And the, I guess the, the the real question behind this is, you know, is this a commodity blow off or is this the start of some sort of commodity super cycle? And um, so I wanted to sort of just talk, you know, what, there's this idea of a blow off top and I've just, I've stolen a chart from, from Investopedia here, which is you know, their, their definition of it. And it's basically this idea that um, to, you know, towards the end of the cycle, uh, you get this sudden um, sharp upward movement and then a, uh, a sort of equally sharp um, move down the other side once you sort of hit the top. And it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of people all in buying and, and, and really pushing these prices up and, and you know, there's talk about the volumes and things like that that go through. And, you know, until today, I was, um, uh, these charts were all, I've got a bunch of charts on this next page, just of, of some of the major commodities. Uh, we're all sort of pointing straight up from, from, from lower bases, but um, now we're actually, uh, we're seeing the top of that. So, so we've got this blow off top and we've got these commodities 
Um, you know, I've got gold, copper, nickel. Nickel's probably the poster child for it, but there's there's some other things going on in, in nickel. Um, you know, aluminium, uh, oil, wheat. I've all got that. You know, spike upwards, and and actually they've they've all started this spike back downwards again, um, uh, just overnight, in terms of the uh, in terms of price movements. So, not to say you know. Maybe it is all done and dusted, and it's blow off top. And you know, last night's moving to proving it. You know, but but um, I think it, it's it's quite early to to uh, to assume that. And uh, you know, we think it probably is. But uh, you know, let's we want to sort of go through some of the factors, I guess, in more detail in terms of these uh, in terms of commodities and and supply and, and demand and and things like that, just to uh, just to talk through you know what we could possibly see uh, going forward. So Dave, if you've got any other thoughts on the blow-off sort of definitions? Uh, <clears throat> no, no. I mean, I, I would say your Investopedia chart's a pretty good one for the way I'm thinking about this at the moment. Uh, like, I mean, we'll get to this uh, through through the other subjects, um, but uh, this is obviously exacerbating the circumstances we already found ourselves in terms of uh, commodities were, were pretty red hot um, coming out of COVID supply side restriction uh, and the inflation burst that we've seen out of stimulus, particularly in the US. Uh, and so uh, in terms of uh, inflation and interest rates, it's only made things worse. Mm. And that I guess reinforces the notion that this could well be a blow off top uh, because it's it's going to encourage uh, particularly the Federal Reserve in the US to continue to, well, it hasn't started tightening unbelievably uh, given the amount of volatility that it's uh, putative tightening has already unleashed, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's not going to stop it. It's going to keep it going more aggressively if anything uh, and so a blow off top makes sense in terms of this frame of reference. If we have a weakening global economy, we know the inventory cycle is maturing. And then we've had this, you know, uh, extraordinary blow off, blow off in commodities that's going to cause demand destruction. Then you can, you can see how that chart on Investopedia actually fits with uh, the, the evolving circumstances of the global economy. And uh, just one more thing I'd add on that chart is I, I would think, uh, and we'll get to this in further detail, but if we do see the Fed sort of, you know, blow up the cycle, if you like, and commodities come off, which I think it kind of has to do now, uh, then we'll probably end up with, you know, a higher price deck for a lot of these commodities that are drawn into the Russian sanctions regime over the long term. Or longer term, given my outlook for for Ukraine is pretty poor, and and the uh, durability of the sanctions regime in particular, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that this is an immensely inflationary outcome, because you need a lot more than commodities to generate systemic inflation. In fact, you know commodities can go up a lot, and then if they don't keep going up, then you end up with zero inflation the next year anyway. Yeah. Uh, you need them to trigger further inflationary impulses. So, so I think that's a pretty good chart, basically. Mm. Yeah. And it's worth noting as well that, like within some of these, uh, when you start looking at the commodities, you know exactly what you're talking there. That the the idea of the input cost. So, so say wheat, um, you know, as an input cost into a into a loaf of bread is actually relatively low. Um, you know, I think it's in the sort of fifteen to twenty percent range, um, uh, or, or, or sorry, maybe fifteen to twenty cents is probably a better way to put it in terms of the the uh, the, the cost of your wheat within one of these. So even if your wheat price doubled, um, you know, you're talking about, you know, on a loaf of bread going from adding, adding another 15 cents to the loaf of bread, you know, the, most of it, most of the cost is really in the, uh, the production, the, you know, the, the rent that the person's paying and the, and the, you know, depending upon how, how fancy your bakery is, that you're buying it from, you know, the, yes. you know, the, 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 all the artisanal parts behind it. So, you yes. know, the, the actual, change of a wheat similar with coffee um you know again all the, all the cost is in um you know having a barista there and the, you know the, the cost of their facial hair and you know all the all the things that go into the uh into the the, the, the delivery of a of a latte so um you know that's that's sort of a yeah. obvious 
four or five in, in developed day. economies anyway, but not not so in emerging markets. Obviously, that's uh, yes, much more yeah, of a problem. Right. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've seen in previous iterations of this, in 2011 mm. with the uh, Arab Spring and things of that nature. Yeah, yeah. Well, well let's get to that as well because that's uh, I think that's that's certainly a, a um, yeah one of these one of these risks in terms of um, where we can go with that. And so yeah, so. The um, it, it, what it really relies on, as Dave was alluding to before, is this idea that uh, this sort of inflation from these things have to then flow on. So the idea behind the uh, sanctions then with is really looking into saying, well, which which of these sanctions um, uh, can Russia get around, and then which of them are, are they pretty stuck? And so uh, the, the sanctions say for um, well, actually, let's let's talk wheat initially. Russia does produce a lot of wheat. Potentially, it could uh, it could ship a lot of that wheat to, to China or, or um, maybe India, other countries that that are that might be happy not to be part of the sanctions, um, uh, which would then just mean you know that everything shifts around a bit. I think the, though there is a very real risk that um, and, and probably you'd say a probability that the um, uh, the, the the Ukrainian wheat uh, they just won't have the, the same. Um, planting cycle and, and they might then even if they could get the the wheat I think a lot of it gets shipped out from some of the ports and so uh, which Russia is quite possibly going to be blockading so you know there's the wheats sort of on, um, depending upon which which one you're talking about I guess um, if you're talking about commodities which which uh, Russia is primarily exporting then it's then it's a question about how how we can get around these export bans uh, for something like uh, the uh, the gas, it's going to be very hard for Russia to um, to actually export the gas. The problem is the gas largely sits sort of over on the uh, over on the western side of of Russia, and it's uh, if it wants to get that gas to, to China, it's uh, it's too far to go. They had to build um, you know thousands of kilometers of uh, of gas pipelines if they want to pipe it there, or they're going to have to build LNG plants. And so there's no real quick win for and them there. They're going to have to build those plants without the help of any of the major Western oil and gas firms or, or Bechtel or anyone basically who produces the stuff. So yeah, yeah, exactly. It's pretty much so, impossible. Yeah. Whereas oil is probably, I mean, that's, uh, I've got this thing up about it, what I call effective sanctions where you know, we've seen the oil price already in Russia crash to, to trade at a huge uh, discount to, to elsewhere. And part of that's a problem that uh, now that Russia's in an active war, uh, if you sail your ship into into a Russian port, um, you quite possibly don't have insurance, and so for that reason, a lot of oil tankers have basically said, "Well, we're not going to Russia to, to pick it up." Yeah. And so um, th that's there's potentially ways around that though. Um, you know, China could could start insuring some of these ships directly, or, or, or have its own ships, or Russia could 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 buy a you know a, buy. A, gradually build up its own fleet of ships and, and use those to, to take it to um, to countries that, that would trade with it. Um, so it's a sort of shorter term, I guess, I guess from my perspective, there's a shorter term issue into, around oil, which which can probably be be, um, uh, uh, be be navigated given sort of six to 12 months, I guess, of, of, of changes. Uh, gas, I think, is is, is much harder and, and, and probably intractable problem. They've either got to export it to Europe or, or, um, or use it internally and, and I don't think there's a a, uh, a longer term solution there for them, uh, and then the other big ones, the agricultural things from China itself. I think there's a, um, I do think there's scope for them to to again, um, you know, skirt the bans by selling to countries that that, that haven't got the sanctions. Um, so that was a, that's one part of the sanctions. The next part then is is what we've seen in terms of you know, reputational risk for companies and, and you know which companies are withdrawing from from Russia and which ones aren't. And, and and I guess what what's ending up is you're ending up with effectively uh, sanctions, regardless of whether they've actually been put on or not. Um, mm. Your know, company's just deciding that's it. I'm not going to have anything to do with um, with what's happening in Russia. And and that's um, we spoke a little bit about the, in the lead of the show, but that's very hard to reverse. So if a company's made the decision not to go into Russia, and then there's a peace, you know, peace treaty over the next week or or, or two weeks. Um, you know, the company's going to reverse and say, oh, okay, we've now decided everything's fine. Um, I think for the large part, what we'll see is uh, once companies have gone and, and decided not to, that's, you know, that's, we're talking decades before that sort of change and, and reverse that decision. Yeah. 
Uh, Dave, not sure if you got any other thoughts on, on sanctions. No, no I just go to your last point there on cancel culture. I mean, these things are reinforced by <clears throat> cancel culture, which is just, just, um, I, I guess, uh, the, the kind of sentiment, sentimental view of geopolitics that I've described earlier, that's at large in the Western media. And certainly I'm very likely the population as well in, in the majorities. Uh, reinforce uh, the second problem, reputational risk. I mean, you 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 might want to venture into Russia and think you you know you're buying low and um, uh, it'll be good for profits, but uh, imagine doing so and then having your products boycotted by consumers in in uh, in Western economies, which is you know obviously uh, a, an extreme risk at this point given the degree to which Putin and Russia has been demonised. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, I don't mean to say that they're, they're nice guys, but uh, that's just the reality of it. Mm. Uh, and so I think the cancel culture feature of it just surprised me to some extent. Like, I didn't think it would be quite so powerful, but it is. Well, uh, and that's you, and Ukraine, winning this propaganda war you're talking about. It is, quite right. Um, and so you've got, you know, bars pouring their vodka down the gurgler and... Uh, it makes the sanctioned regime much more effective uh, at a grassroots level. Uh, and so it's going to be very, very nasty for the Russian economy. Uh, so I would just add, I suppose, the one of the other tail risks is the uh, instability in Russia, of course. So uh, mm. and, how, long, and how long it takes before well, the population there gets upset at, uh, at the degree of inconvenience and suffering they're enduring for this war. Yeah, and there's and and across the board, you know, Russia's got a lot of other problems in terms of internalizing things where you know, they, they were reliant on a lot of parts from Boeing, which are which are no longer available. Um, uh, Russia's also well, and part of the, on, the, on the airlines have seized a bunch of planes, um, and uh, and so that's you know creates another sort of ongoing issue of what people are whether there's retribution there from from companies sort of affected by that. But but you look at com companies like uh, Renault that that have some um, production in in uh in russia but they can't get the parts from because no longer western um countries are no longer supplying the parts and so uh you know there's there's companies that may end up shutting down uh in those partly because of the, some of the backlash but but also because um the production is just uh you know without actually going and, and trying to create um companies to create the parts that they need to sort of build it all the way up and sort of internalize it the whole process which is a sort of decade-long process um, yeah, they might be left at, um, with, with few other options except to shut down anyway. Yeah. And again, on cancel culture, uh, if we don't find an off-ramp for this conflict soon, uh, then you can see um, that the cancel culture dimension of it is going to get much, much worse because the suffering of the Ukrainian people is going to get much, much worse. Hmm. So the idea that, that companies could, could deal with Russia at all in any in anything other than a relatively swift off ramp for for the invasion uh, is pretty fanciful. Mm. And, and you know, as an example, Russia took I think it must have been close to ten years to, to sort of um, subdue Chechnya um, with a couple of million people in it versus a you know forty four million people uh, in in the Ukraine. Yeah. And and the um, but you know, I guess the question I guess I've got for you, David, is um, there's a lot of support for these uh, for, for sanctions and, and and an incredible amount of support globally. Uh, so fast forward, you know, if it does bog down, fast forward, you know, six months and it's no Ukraine is no longer on the front page of every newspaper every day. Uh, there's quite possibly, you know, three, four, five million refugees bouncing around Europe uh, from the Ukraine uh, and and prices for oil and, and gas and, and all these other ones are, are, are stoking inflation. Uh, do you think that maybe some of the uh, some of the Western resolve might might start to ebb? Uh, <clears throat> not really, no, because I, I don't I mean, I think the cancel culture is is a is 
throwing a bit of petrol on the fire, but it's not the fire itself. The key driver here is, is um, geopo geopolitics and the nature of strategic thought between states. Uh, and so it's very difficult to back out <clears throat> of these um, tensions and conflicts uh, when you, you have phrases like existential threat being used by a great power. Like Russia, Russia has, uh, and Putin has staked his, its reputation on getting this done. And, and so, um, the, you know, even if, if Western resolve, um, starts to wane, I think that that would be a red rag to a Russian bull, if you like, and it would again, double down because for the Russians, I, I, I think this is. I think the key calculation here is Russian resolve, not Western resolve, basically. And so as long as the Russians are determined to get this done, then the Western sanction regime just doesn't budge, just just stays intact. And if, if some of the um, uh, sentiment starts to wane in, in popular terms, it won't matter. It's about what this, how states deal with one another and how that whole Westphalian state system works. It's just, uh, you know, we have a great power that feels threatened and it's going to do what it has to do to not feel threatened again. Uh, and, and then, you know, you throw in the US that's just kind of cocked this up rather badly, um, being humiliated or otherwise. Um, uh, it's just very difficult for these states to come to terms once they reach this point. So I don't, I don't see uh, an easy um, wind down of the sanctions regime. Period. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I concur with that. And, and look, you know that uh, even if, if you like the political pressure on Western governments to do something uh, as the war fades in, in collective consciousness diminishes, I don't think it'll matter. That's what I'm saying. Mm. It's not yeah. the key calculation. Yes. Well, and I think you know that's obviously. Um, US and, and other countries being involved in places like Afghanistan or, or Iraq, you know, I think even after uh, you know, the consensus was reached that it, it was no longer it was no longer worth doing, it still took you know five years or, or, or so to to, to yeah. actually start to. to, to yeah, yeah, there's immense control. inertia in these things. Mm. You know, once they're running, it's very very difficult to turn them around. Yeah. Okay, so so then I want to talk. The next thing I want to talk about is the supply elasticity. So it's one thing to say, okay, we've, we're short of oil, or we're short of gas, or we're short of um, wheat, and then the question is, you know, how how reactive is supply to uh, to each of these as a um, uh, and and then we'll look second at, at at the demand side, and you know how much how how quickly does demand bounce bounce back and forth. So I've got a chart here of the. Um, uh, from the EIA, which is a, the US um, uh, government organization that puts together their, their views. And, and that's you know, it's a very recent one, just looking at what they're expecting in terms of demand um, versus supply in terms of, uh, in terms of the oil market. Now, there's obviously a, a dent in, in terms of the, the supply side, pot potentially. But um, yeah, they had it, uh, I guess, after a number of years of, of where uh, demand had uh, outstripped supply, sort of following the uh, the start of the pandemic, they had was basically coming into uh, coming into a period where, well, the first quarter was basically even, and then they had it that um, going into a period where supply was was greater than demand. So I don't know if you've got any, want to give us your thoughts around this, Dave? Uh, so we're losing what? Um, five to seven million barrels from Russia? Yep. In the export market, uh, I think. Well, sorry, as, as could up to up to that. That's what they're exporting at the moment. Yes. So the, I guess the up question is, and we're going to lose most of that initially. Um, uh, I do think that your point about China is salient. I do. I think they'll find a way to get oil out. Uh, and so, to some extent, it's not just about supply elasticity. It's about. Um, uh, um, fungibility, 
So China ends up with more Russian oil, buys less from OPEC or, or others, and that oil ends up elsewhere. Where Europe. In Europe, you know, people that used to buy the Russian oil. So I think that's a, going to be, a, you know, quite a large factor in how the market balances this, this out. Um, and and notwithstanding, that, just there are differences in oil and, and they'll have to reconfigure course, no, yes, mining yes. and all this other stuff like that. I get that. But yeah, yep. there's a, no, no, there's a, yeah, there's a solution course. there that's, that's 12 months. Look, sort yeah, of, yeah, look, there's friction in it for those reasons. It's not going to be immediate, but it, it'll happen. Um, the supply elasticity in some ways I think will be quite good in the sense that we've had, uh, you know, a long period here of um, weak demand for oil. And so there's a fair bit of shut-in production still that can come back online uh, as well because of the context of uh, climate change and energy transition there have been there's been a fair bit of energy that has been earmarked as uh, you know a dud asset that can be sustained over time now with prices higher so for instance this week we saw the Gippsland JV in in Australia which is basically bass straight uh, gas largely and some oil uh, uh, it was going to shut in a lot of platforms in May this year, and it just did a two-year extension on that uh, because with prices where they are, they can print money, basically. Now, that's going to be replicated worldwide. Um, anywhere that is within a, in particular, anywhere that is within a geopolitically acceptable regime by that i mean i suppose within the us alliance network or or within the european sphere of influence so you know north africa for instance is going to be selling a lot more energy to europe uh, and so you're going to see a lot of what were to be shuttered production uh, be sustained and then you've got you know of course us shale which has to date uh, kind of acted as a mini OPEC in this cycle where it's um, it's had a bit of a gentleman's agreement to to not print sorry to not to not uh, pump. R pump rush out and drill like it has in the, in the previous two cycles uh, they the conviction on that you would expect to to uh, fray quickly and aggressively with prices where they are now because I mean shalers, at this junction can for the first time ever really just print money like there's no tomorrow um uh, yeah. so i would expect a, a very aggressive uh supply response from the us and and um you know there you know oil is tight there's no doubt about it uh this will take time and so i do not expect oil prices to come down in a hurry in fact i think probably the you know the certainly a very substantial contributor to how we balance the oil market will be demand destruction. And so, you know, one of the commodities that I think perhaps may not have blown off and topped is oil, which, you know, may be uh, equally, therefore, uh, you know, to the extent that it drives other commodity prices, then, that, you know, that'll play a role in those. Uh, you know, because if, if demand destruction is going to have to play a key role, then at 100, what are we today, 110? I don't think that's high enough. Mm. Uh, so we're certainly going to have some supply response, some supply elasticity. Uh, I, I don't... It's going, take, it's going to take a year. It's going to take a year or two, and I, I don't fully buy the whole underinvestment theme that's being pushed by Wall Street. Uh you know, that we're in a structural uh, bull market for oil and other commodities because we've underinvested for 10 years. I don't think that's true. We underinvested because we were so oversupplied, basically following the China boom. Uh, and and so uh, that's, that's a bit of a, a bubble narrative to my mind, but it is going to take time to rebalance this. But that's probably a good point to jump off into demand, is it? Uh, is it Demo, yeah, we started to talk about demand destruction. Yeah, maybe for maybe we'll jump. Oh, you, oh, you want to look, look at some other commodities first? Well, yeah, yeah maybe if, 
yeah okay let's yeah let's 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 just talk quickly i just let's talk um we'll talk wheat and uh and metals as well I, I was using copper as an example here i've got a chart up just of the copper growth in in world copper mine production over the last sort of 120 odd years and you can see that it grows from sort of 500 million tons to um or 500 000 tons sorry to, to 20 million tons over um you know over the period and and in particular um you know since the 2000s when that when china really took off um, it's doubled in terms of the, the mine production. Uh, and this doesn't include recycling as well. Recycling sort of sits on top of this as, as extra. There's been a lot more recycling as well. Um, it's about 8 million um, tonnes as well of, or I think even 9 million tonnes of, of, of recycling now. Um, and so, yeah, that's grown um, pretty exponentially as well. The issue is uh, the last couple of years has actually seen no growth at all. Uh, so, you know, since 2018, um, or and arguably since 2016, um, Copper has you know, really just gone nowhere in terms of the, the, the mine production growth. There's a fair bit um, coming on over the next year or two, but um, I guess the main point I'm, I'm making here is th we're not talking about a cop. We're not talking about a, a commodity cycle where um, we've got this straight line going up in terms of demand that there's all this extra supply, all this extra copper is needed, and, um, and and people are out there building mines, but they just can't build fast enough. That was what we saw in the in the in the 2000s as China was booming. Uh, this hasn't been the case at all. This has basically been demand and supply have basically been stuck for the last five years, and um, uh, and so and prices are now shooting up on, on the back of, of, of lack of supply. Um, and, and it's you know it's not as if there's there's not the copper out there and and, and there's even some coming on. Um, it's it's more about this idea that uh, it's again just really a question of time. So potentially a little bit longer. You know if you've got to start start something new. But um, we do have a number of projects sort of all, all coming on over the next year or two that will certainly soak up a, a bit of the demand. And then if we, so if we see any sort of fall off in, in supply, sorry, uh, a bit of some, we'll bring on some extra supply. So if you see any fall off in demand, then, then it's quite, um, quite easy to see how that could go into, into surplus as well and, and start seeing those back. And that's yeah. sort of similar to what you see, you know, depending upon what commodity, but, you know, that's, uh, it's sort of similar across those ones. Yeah, um, I mean, in terms, we'll come back to this in terms of China's role that uh, the transition in the Chinese economy is is pretty vital to both the bulks and and the base metals. Mm. Uh, and in the case of copper, something like twenty percent of global consumption is is China, uh, and a huge swathe of that is its property market, which is in absolute dire straits. Yeah, uh, and so copper. <clears throat> Copper inventories have been extremely tight on the LME, uh, but they've but it's piling up in China because they, they're just not using it uh, anywhere near at the same rates as they were previously, yeah. uh, uh, and so there are big demand questions arising from China. We'll come back to that, but just mm. in terms of yeah. uh, why why copper uh, has been stalled out for a number of years, uh, China is is also part of that. Equation. Yeah, so I guess so I guess what I'm I'm getting to on the on the metal side is look, um, there, there's there's lots available. Um, generally, there's uh, bringing a new mine on though do, does take years. Like it's whereas you can see some, uh, the, especially the US fracking side on, on the oil side can bring bring on uh, production a lot faster, and some of the existing wells can bring on a lot, production a lot faster. Um, there will be some mines that will start up, some some mines that were shuttered. That can that can start up relatively quickly, but but generally speaking, they they won't be high volumes. Um, that's more just going to be people sort of you know scraping the the last dregs out of a mine that, that might not have been profitable at, at half the price. Uh, so you know, so if there are genuine increases in supply needed, um, you're talking about years to get that supply elasticity. Um, it's just a yeah, we don't think there is um, based on a lot of that 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 China. Um, so we'll get back. We'll get to that demand in a sec. And the only other one for supply side is then uh, is or the, the other major one is the wheat um, side, which is you know really for uh, a question for the Ukraine, given they're they're such a large supplier. Uh, I think terms, the world's the world's largest supplier of wheat, is it right? I think I think together China, Russia and the Ukraine together are the world's largest supplier. Mm. Um, it's it was it's certainly up there in terms of its um it's mm. it's in the top five. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think they're so, both in the top five. Yeah. So the question then is is really about um, uh, 
reconfiguration in, in, in my view is that if you've got wheat prices that, that have jumped, say, whatever, 30, 40% and, and other crops that haven't jumped, then what you'll see is the next planting season in, in Canada, the next planting season in Australia, um, you know, other, other places that, are, that can, um, can, can make wheat, you'll, be, you'll see conversion of, of other crops into wheat. And so, um, so there is uh, there is supply elasticity there, but it it does take again, um, you know, another planting season, and so six months at, at the minimum, and, and and more likely to be to be a year to sort of start to really get around those um, to get around those problems. And, and you're not really getting around, you know, the global problem in terms of food prices. All you're doing is you'll even it out. So rather than it being all in in wheat, you know, wheat rather than being a massive jump and a lot of other commodities and a lot of other um, uh, agricultural commodities not moving as much, you'll sort of just push wheat down a bit and even it out by, by increasing the prices of some of the other crops that as people sort of move, move around what they're, um, what they take, what they're, what they're planting. Mm. I mean, we're still in a bit of a La Nina as well. So that's, that's playing, playing a role in terms of, uh, grains production uh, we've been in it for a while so it's, it will probably diminish yeah and it is help and, and it's 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 the changes as you see you know obviously the flooding right throughout um you know southeast queensland and 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 uh northern new south wales will will, will make differences to um you know, to, to certain crops that they, they grow and, and so you get shortages in those areas. And similarly, when, you, when you're when you looking at drought and, and things like that in, in other parts of the country, in other, sorry, parts of the world. So so Brazil in particular, um, you know, has been hit by drought a number of times. And, um, you know, it's quite critical in terms of if it gets the rain at the right time, uh, in Brazil in particular, if it gets the rain at the right time for, for planting, then a lot of these problems could easily just go away in terms of, you know, Brazil all of a sudden floods the market because it has a great um, a great season. But the flip side is, if it has a poor season, then um, yeah, that's got um, yeah, just adds on top of the, uh, the the problems we already have. Uh, and so that's then sort of leading through into demand destruction. So the first one, I'll, um, and actually, I know we've got a lot of questions up. We might just uh, I might just do this demand destruction, maybe Sam, and then we'll we'll jump into some questions before we keep going. Um, so on the demand destruction, the, the important point I wanted to note, and this is on the oil. So, so I've got the US um, total number of vehicle miles, um, miles traveled versus the uh, the spot crude oil price. And- Just excuse the, me a minute. Yep. And the, uh, the key thing with this chart is what it's really showing is that where, um, when you get these spikes in oil prices, what tends to happen is it, it's, it slows down the uh, the growth in vehicle miles. It goes backwards a little bit, sort of in the initial stages, uh, and then. But but um, you know, it's 2010 to 2015 is a pretty good example of where the, the total vehicle miles travelled in in the US basically sideline went sideways for um, so for sort of five or six years while we had high oil prices, and um, and then once oil prices fell back down again, sort of post 2015, uh, you started to see the growth again in that, and so. It doesn't tend to um, doesn't t well in, in the past. It hasn't tended to destroy demand in terms of um, uh, you know, great big falls in the in the amount of distance travelled, but it does tend to slow any any growth uh, that we're seeing. Uh, Europe's been a, a little bit of a different matter in that you've actually been seeing that the number of vehicle miles travelled per person has been falling, and population growth has been has been very poor as well, and so. Um, uh, that that looks a bit different in terms of when you when you look through those, uh, but you know I guess the the key point is um, that you don't really see big shifts in demand. You'll see at the margin you will, but you just you don't see enough to then sort of um, sort of all of a sudden free up um, heaps of heaps of um, extra oil. The one ex exception to that obviously was a pandemic where uh, we where we did see that big drop, but um, we've now seen the bounce back. And um, and we haven't actually hit the quite hit the the, the prior levels, um, which given the uh, given the sort of shortages of public transport, or sorry, the, the the lack of people on public transport is is quite likely that we'll, we we will see this you know some reasonable growth just in, on the back of people changing uh, behaviour on on terms of that. Um, yeah, so so oil, yeah, as I said, not a lot, probably not a lot of demand destruction, but but just a bit of weaker in terms of growth. 
Uh, in terms of food prices, uh, I, there's the most important factor is coming back to what's happening in in emerging markets because in, in emerging markets, um, you know, an increase in, the, in in food prices by 10, 20 you know, 30% makes a massive difference to household budgets. And that's where you get um, significant regime change. We had the Arab Spring last time that we had, um, you know, spikes in, in food prices. Uh, I've got a chart up of food prices over the last sort of 100 odd years. Um, and just sort of showing that, you know, the wheat prices we've seen are on that top graph. I've, I've sort of up, updated that one for the, for the um, you know, for the latest changes. You really, it's, it's, it, it has been a big it's been a big change in terms of percentages but um, you know as you can see from that if you look at real food prices uh, it's it's still nowhere near what they were uh, you know over that sort of longer time frame and, and food as a, as a total spend um, for people is is no longer as high uh, it you know, these prices and, and we spoke about you know the, the price of coffee within a Within the actual cup of coffee that the end user buys, they're, they're really not that much. Most of it is a servicing part, and so um, you know the, the demand destruction you'll see is probably going to be pretty limited from from Western countries. Uh, there, there's uh, a different question for for uh, emerging markets and whether that ends up you know, um, you know in, in manifesting itself in that the Western countries keep buying the food because. Um, but, you know, they don't really care that the wheat prices have gone up. It just means that their, their loaf of bread that might have cost, you know, your, your artisanal sourdough that you're buying for $6 now costs you $6.20, um, which doesn't change too many people's uh, behaviour in, in a Western market. But um, in a uh, in, in some emerging markets, you know, they end up, people end up not buying bread and, and, and just not eating as much food. And so that's where the, the demand destruction sort of ends up being pushed around. Um, and the final one was uh, was talking about this China. So I've got a chart up here. China's and and, and in particular its effect on on commodities. So uh, so China has very much been um, the driver of the commodity market. If you looked over the last sort of 10, 15 years, just this massive growth in terms of uh, construction, and, and that's really driven um, them from being a you know, net exporter of. of some commodities into net importer and 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 now and from there to being the world's biggest importer of of, of most commodities uh and you can see that starts line um so you know still sort of early days this is residential floor space started um but it's 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 fallen quite dramatically and uh there's no real signs of that turning around and um you know there's there's been a hundred small things the the Chinese government's done to to try and ease the the pain of the the falling of that decline, but um, you know that decline is 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 quite marked compared to what we've seen over the last few years, and and that's going to flow through into you know, that's demand destruction that's that's not sort of price sensitive that that's already happening regardless of what the price is doing, um, and so where our you know our view is that yes you will get demand destruction in, in throughout um, most commodities most uh, metal commodities. Uh, off the back of this, uh, it'll it'll just take a little while to um, for that to really manifest. That that'll help ease the, the the any losses and structural problems we have with with Russia. And then as as the problems get sorted out in terms of um, commodity delivery, um, you can quite easily see a, a reasonable down leg in in a lot of the commodities sort of um, where the prices have rallied. Dave, over to you on demand destruction. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean the China component is is very important for the bulks and metals uh, uh, until you know the the uh, temporary shortages that arose through COVID uh, converted most of Wall Street to to a uh, uh, commodities resurgence narrative. Uh, this you know China was the key driver of all commodity prices. So I'm still uh, amazed today that um, things like iron ore and coking coal uh, are at staggering prices in the middle of what is like clearly a massive demand bust. Uh, and there's no real sense that uh, the Chinese are, are going to change this or turn it around uh, unless it gets so bad, as we've discussed before, that they're forced to 
throw the kitchen sink of credit back at, at the housing market. Uh, it still looks like they're very d determined to continue this adjustment in in building in China, and so uh, uh, this this should just basically persist uh, unless it gets terrible. Now it could very well get terrible, so uh, you know I'm not discounting that possibility. But the determination of Chinese authorities is very obvious, uh, and so you're going to see. Uh, Chinese demand weigh very heavily on on some pretty key commodities. Mm -hmm. I might jump in, Sam, into some of the questions we've had. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we've had a, a few questions coming through around what's actually driving this inflation, and uh, uh, what's the interaction of uh, fertilizer prices in terms of uh, the food commodities there. Yeah, look, that's an, that is an important one. Um, yeah, in terms of some some fertilisers and some of the quite key ones is that uh, yeah they're produced from gas and gas prices have, have absolutely rocketed, um, uh, and to, to the point where um, there's fertiliser plants effectively shutting down in 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 Europe. They're they're shutting they're shuttering them because they're basically saying well at the price we we can buy our gas for, um, you know. To make a profit, we'll have to increase our fertilizer prices to, to levels that are so high that that farmers can't justify buying the fertilizers at that at that level. And so, um, yeah, and so that is a, that is an issue, and that's actually going to, um, you know, if that continues, that's going to create issue that, that that will create problems for um, for the supply side, further problems for the supply side on, in terms of um, uh, in terms of commo agricultural commodities, uh, and, and weather dependent. So if you get a a a poor set of weather and this pullback, then yeah, you could really see the um, you know, some some real food shortages. Um, the flip side is yeah, as I said, if you get if you happen to get good weather, particularly Brazil, um, that could that could even uh, that that would even out a lot of the losses of fertilizer. Um, yeah, so uh, is that going to create problems going forward? Well, look, I think that's that's all comes down to to Europe getting off that supply in terms of. Um, you know what can they do in terms of the uh, how can they how can they release themselves from from the supply of German uh, gas? And I don't think there's a there's no short term wins for that. I think in the medium term uh, there's there's definitely a number of things they can do. And and at current gas prices, you know, solar plus batteries is is clearly um, uh, economically sensible even in Europe, where uh, where you know solar solar was sensible in in parts of Europe. Um, solar plus batteries was was pretty marginal um, unless you you had some you, you factored in some pretty high carbon tax prices but but you know Vladimir's given us a, a global carbon tax now and um, and so uh, yeah that I think fertilizer prices are going to be high for some time thanks for that I hope that uh, answers a few of the questions that have come through we've just got one other question here um, just wondering if there, if you guys have got any comments about banking uh, and other current uh, currencies like the uh, Chinese yuan and Russian currency. Yes. Well, uh, is it was that anything more specific in that question, or just general it was comment? Just a general comment. Just uh, just getting your viewpoint, really. Uh, okay. Well, we'll we'll probably come back to this in what we, what's coming up when we talk about the Fed, but bank funding costs are rising globally uh, in, in the core, that is in America, in the US dollar monetary system. Uh, it's not entirely clear why that's happening yet, whether it is uh, the sanction regime, which has uh, effectively um, frozen you know, up to half a trillion in Russian Forex reserves and whether they're being pushed around, uh, whether it is the crisis in commodities that ha has blown up any number of players already, including, you know, Chinese billionaire and um, some others that is, have driven some pretty crazy short squeezes uh, and the role of commodities uh, as collateral in terms of uh, funding for, for various entities around the place and whether that's playing a role in, in forcing interest rates higher 
the key interest rates, sort of interbank funding interest rates I'm talking about in, in the US and which is, you know, basically what sets them for everybody. Uh, or whether it's the looming rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. It's not clear what, what role each of these three and, and, are playing. And, and I'll give you a fourth as well, David, is uh, risk aversion about we just don't know, you know, are you going to start, is this yes. something going to turn around that, and say well, we'd lent a bunch of money to, to Russia or is it, we're not going to get back? Or Yes, and the fact that there's three questions or four questions that you can ask and not answer uh, is enough for a spread all by itself. So, um, so... In terms of banks, at this point, we are seeing rising funding costs. They're not extreme, certainly not in Australia yet, but we are starting to see BBSW move upwards. Uh, and so, you know, you can argue that either this is temporary or it's the beginning of essentially a new financial crisis. Um, uh, I think the jury's out, but um, on the various factors involved, um, but I do think that we are kind of headed in that direction, more generally speaking, just because the Federal Reserve is on the warpath over inflation. So for me, in the end, that will be the key consideration. How much these other factors exacerbate that uh, will eventually be important in the sense that if it all gets out of hand in terms of bank funding costs, then the Federal Reserve uh, is going to be forced to do something uh, very unusual in insofar as uh, it might force it to, to either uh, open currency swap lines with other central banks, in effect, or re resume forms of quantitative easing while it raises interest rates. Uh, and so that has all sorts of kooky implications for different asset classes if we get to that point. Um, but Basically, at this point, there are problems emerging in banking spreads, and it is a concern, and I do expect it to get worse. So I hope that answers the question. And at the same time as well... It's not as, alarming uh, yet, but we have yeah. to be alert to it. Yeah, and the other, the other, the same time, we've also seen um, uh, yield curves flatten, which basically means banks, banks make less money as yield curves get flatter as well. So, yeah, profitability is being hit at the same time. Yes, so, uh, you know, like if we want to be a bit more specific about it for Australia, a lot of this spread widening is not yet threatening for bank profitability. Uh, but, you know, the recent couple of last week or so, we have seen some pretty good moves. Uh, and so, you know, in trend terms, uh, if it continues, it will become a problem. There's some, the other thing in terms of Australian banks is we haven't seen the curve flatten yet. Uh, we've actually got a very steep, uh, yield curve here, which frankly I think is absurd, um, and some have argued it, it's the result of the RBA kind of being blown up on its yield curve control stuff earlier in the or last year, uh, which has damaged its credibility. So the market is more or less just uh, not seeing the RBA as credible, and therefore is just selling off uh, bonds and. Uh, giving Australia a much steeper curve than elsewhere, which is, you know, in economic terms, telling you that Australia is going to have a boom. And that's obviously, uh, you know, further um, underlined or in, or that, that narrative is encouraged by the fact that commodity prices are all going nuts. Uh, but uh, I think the fact is that at the moment the RBA tightens, we, you know, the, the long end of the Australian curve should flatten the same as anywhere else. Uh, and in fact, if the US kind of, curves flattening so fast that I, I can't see how the, uh, the Australian can keep steepening for very much longer uh, because it's it's indicating that, uh, you know, the various forces that we've discussed in terms of bank funding costs rising are going to impact economic growth before very long. So, you know, is Australia an, uh, an island and discreet from all of that? No. Right. Well, that sort of leads us into this, the risks as well. So I'm just going to, I'm going to run, run give, in the interest of time, I'll just run quite, quite quickly through these because there are, you know, a whole bunch of them out there and, um, uh, and each one of them, you know, you could spend a, a, a podcast talking about. So, 
um, you know, financial risk of financial crisis. We've sort of touched on it a few different times, but you know, there's certainly there's things going on um, with the, the plumbing of the um, uh, of international finance, which which make that a, a higher risk than now than, than what it was. Uh, reasonable risk of recession. Effectively, what we're looking at is the Fed having to raise rates to bring down commodity prices, which means that you know and and, and meet this. It's actually not about demand being out of control. It's about um, uh, it's about the supply not being able to meet sort of an ordinary level of demand. So we have to push demand down to, to um, below average levels, you know, so that it, so that the supply can meet it, which quite possibly means recession. Uh, there's supply chain risks all over the place and and increasing with um, with what's happening in terms of sanctions and, uh, and and Russia sort of being taken out of the supply uh, the global supply chain. Uh, we've got inflation stuff going on. Uh, there's retaliatory risks in terms of will uh, will Russia launch um, uh, either uh, its own sanctions in terms of not supplying things to, to say you know, cut gas off to Europe or, or not supply um, titanium to to um, places that need it, uh, or, or there's just a, the risk of uh, cyber warfare that in terms of um, you know, Russia just trying to um, disrupt. Uh, Western systems to um, to try and um, I guess to uh, in, in in retaliation for Western support of, of the Ukraine, uh, you know the more extreme risks. There's there's uh, can can Russia do something on the nuclear side, and uh, and then the stability in terms of the general Russian regime stability. Uh, you know, if if the sanctions begin to bite, um, or they already have begun to bite, but if the sanctions, if if the person average Russian in the street. Um, he looks at those sanctions and starts to um, starts to wonder why they are uh, attacking uh, the Ukraine and, and and starts to push back. Then then maybe there's um, stability issues for uh, for the Russian regime as well that we can worry about. So yeah, so lots of risks um, all sort of bubbling away there, and, and um, all at various um, yeah, various probabilities of of happening and and and, um, and severities. I'm not sure, Dave. If there's any other. Risks you want to highlight? Otherwise, we might just jump onto the Fed. I think. No, that, that's enough. Yeah. yeah. Going for the Fed. Yeah. So, so on the Fed, I just want to highlight. So I've got two two charts. Um, I wanted to show one of them is the uh, that it's a ten year Treasury yield minus a two year Treasury yield, and what this is this is basically a look at at um, how flat the yield curve is. So the idea is that when this flattens, um, is when your uh, markets are worried about recessions. And, and when it's quite steep is when markets are, are looking at sort of economic booms. And I've, I've just limited it to the last five years. And so you can see as we came out of the uh, coronavirus, um, that's that gray line in the middle um, where the recession was, um, the, those sort of initial shutdowns, that uh, the, the yield curve start steepened quite, quite markedly, sort of showing that um, we're getting this growth. And then uh, it's, it's very much been flattening though um, for the past six months. And uh, the past few weeks, uh, that's gone to um, that's you know, uh, gone even, even faster. At the same time, I've got inflation expectations. Um, now, this is what's being priced into inflation um, in in economic markets, and so uh, it's basically looking at the, the pricing of some of these inflation um, inflation linked bonds in the US. So. I've got two lines though, and it's slightly confusing in that one's the five-year, five-year forward line. One's the yeah, so the, the the blue line is what's expected, what's the average inf um, inflation that's being priced in over the over the next five years, uh, and that's looking at three and a half, but below three and a half percent at the moment. Uh, but if you look at the the five-year, five-year forward, which is basically saying okay, go go five. It's an inflation expected between five years and ten years. Um, it's come up a little bit, but it's really not that high. It's really um, sort of in that between that um, two and two and a half percent is pretty much where that's been most of the time, and it's sort of towards the upper end of that. But it's certainly not um, particularly high at the moment. We're sort of coming back to that idea that um, we was talking about in terms of saying, look, the there's some short-term issues, some short-term issues with inflation, and, and and those are certainly going to be carried on a lot longer than what we thought before this. Um, uh, before the whole Russia Ukraine uh, invasion. Uh, having said that, though, that the fundamental structure of, of, of the economies um, does seem to, to certainly from financial markets aren't concerned about um, inflation in the longer term. And we're, so, we're also of the view that you know, we will see um, this is probably going to be a catalyst as well to, for people to, to do more supply chains 
um, supply chain uh, sort of bring it back to the, the home country than what they might have done before and more automation and um, and and the, all those factors while while in the short term they'll be inflationary as as they're people are pulling factories out of China or or um, or Europe Eastern Europe and, and bring it back into a home country and, and automating it um, that will be inflationary in the first instance but um, that's going to be very deflationary um, as time goes on uh, because you you'll, you'll start to really benefit from um, capital expenditure over over um, over human uh, over having, having to hire more people and, and pay higher wages every year for um, for, for products and so um, yeah so that's um, that's sort of the, the quick summary of it but um, uh, it, the net effect all comes down to the feds in, a, in an unenviable position of having to raise short-term rates to try and slow the this debate trying to demand to, to back to levels that are below average in order to meet the, um, uh, the, the, the problems we have with supply chains. Uh, Dave, you've, sure you've got others, other comments on the Fed? Yeah, well, it is an unenviable position. You're trying to address the supply side problem with a demand side tool, um, but they're going to do it anyway. Um, <clears throat> the fear of the Fed will not be commodity prices. That's just a little bit of a cherry on top. The fear there is that they've got an overly tight labor market uh, and that they'll end up with a wage push inflation cycle. That's what they're really afraid of. And there is, you know, sort of early evidence of some of that. I don't think it's convincing, uh, but there are certainly areas of the US labor market that are pretty hot. Uh, and moreover, uh, although we're going to get demand destruction from a higher oil price, we're also going to get uh, a lot of new US activity from uh, these higher commodity prices, uh, especially in the, the oil and gas space. Uh, with US shale, it will be pressure now politically as well as just sheer being, being given these incredible prices to pump like crazy. So uh, it will be both, both a tailwind and a headwind for the US. Uh, this commodity blow off. And uh, so the US Fed will be concerned that uh, what is already a tight labor market is going to get worse. And so that'll be their main focus. Uh, now, uh, we've maintained that basically we didn't think that the Fed would get very far before everything would fall apart. And before Russia, we were basically right insofar as you can see that the, uh, the US curve has been uh, selling off, you know, pretty dramatically ever since the Fed started to contemplate tightening. Uh, and, you know, heavily financialized economies like the US and, and in some ways even more so in Australia, uh, with, in Australia's case, very leveraged households. Not That's not so much a concern in the US, it's more corporate debt, but uh, just heavily financial, financialized economies cannot take higher interest rates. It's as simple as that. Uh, you know, we've never been more sensitive to hikes. So nonetheless, the Fed is going to do what it has to do to, uh, to um, they will think they are crimping demand to, uh, to meet um, some of these supply side problems and they'll think they'll get a soft landing, but it just never works that way. Uh, almost by definition, you end up with a Fed that does one too many hikes. The jury is out on how many that will be. It, According to Wall Street, there's anything from seven to nine rate hikes coming over the, the next year. But I put it to you that if the Federal Reserve hikes eight times over the next 12 months, then asset prices will be cratering worldwide. Uh, I just think that's completely untenable with the economic system that we have. Uh, so, but that said, they're going to have to be taught that lesson again. They usually are by the market. So, um, you know, it is all about the Fed. Commodity blow off makes it worse. Things are not so bad in Russia that I think it will cause the Fed to uh, pause or look through uh, the energy price spikes, in part because of the supply side response that will come from the US, which is more activity. I think the RBA is more likely to look through it, um, even though the market doesn't think it will. Uh, I think it will, and in part that's because our household debt is so bad. So I'm not at all convinced that the RBA will get off zero. 
Um, but I think the Fed is going to hike into it. Uh, and so, you know, that's primarily why we've seen so much volatility in equity markets, but increasingly in credit spreads as well. Uh, and as you can see, a flattening curve. So uh, how far does it get? Well, that's the uh, trillion dollar question. Um, it will probably be forced to go further than it was going to by the commodity price spike, but on, that only means that, the, that uh, you know, it, it, you get into a scenario of boom and bust where the Fed is forced to go a little harder, a little higher, a little steeper, and then its policy error is a little greater. And at a certain point, you know, we have this inventory cycle that's maturing in the US. We're going to get end up with a demand hiccup, both from the demand destruction of oil plus the Federal Reserve tightening. And so you get a demand hiccup that immediately flows out into via US imports into China and its goods exports, which have been absolutely booming and the only part of its economy that is booming. Uh, and its domestic demand is really weak. Europe has always got pretty questionable domestic demand and still does even though it's recovering post COVID. And so, you know, it tends to just follow the rest of the world because it's more of an export led economy. Uh, and so you can very quickly see how the inventory pile in the US unwinds into a negative cycle for China and Europe. And it pops commodities as well. Uh, and so I actually think, although there are some structural dimensions to the Russian crisis, that will mean commodity prices are higher than they would have otherwise been if we hadn't seen it. Uh, I don't mean extreme. I mean a kind of shunt higher in the price deck. Uh, that means, you know, slightly higher. We'll pick a number in terms of the, co the overall commodity price deck, especially the key commodities. I think that the monetary cycle is going to trumpet this year uh, and we're going to end up with a bit of an accident in the global economy through the second half of the year. Uh, and so I expect the yield curve to invert and probably end up in a global recession. All right. Excellent. Thank, thanks for that, Dave. Uh, so now we're going to have our viewer question of the week. Uh, so this is for viewers to have some discussion in the comment section over the coming days. So the question of the week is, is this a, a blow off or the start of a commodity super cycle? So feel free to post your thoughts and engage with us and some of the other viewers of the coming days. And uh, so, Damien, I'll hand it back to you for the investment implications. Yeah, given time, we've already shot well past our. I think I might, and we, and most of it has been all about, I guess, investment implications. I might leave it at leave it at that for uh, for this week, if that's all right, Sam. I think we've probably probably covered off on 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 most of it. You know, it's I guess the the, the nutshell is. Um, you know, lots of risks out there. You still want to be quite conservative, and um, it's it's about trying to get that line up your the assets you want to be buying um, if markets uh, you know continue to fall. And so we obviously saw a big bounce last night, and a lot of those you know assets that, that you saw bounce last night are probably the ones you eventually want to buy. It's just a question of whether uh, you know was that really the bottom of the market we saw, or or um, you know, have we got more uh, more risks to come? Which is quite you know, we're in that we're in that second case. Okay, um, fantastic, guys. Thank you so much. We'll just leave it there. Uh, so, Damien, just want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and insights as always. Thanks, Sam. And Dave, um, thank you for your valuable insights and unique perspective as well. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so, we do welcome your feedback on the show, especially in regards to suggestions for future topics. Uh, if you do have any ideas, please drop it in the YouTube comments below or send us an email at contact at nucleuswealth.com. Uh, just a reminder, this is general advice and does not take into account your personal situation. If you do, uh, do want to discuss your personal finances, please go to our website at nucleuswealth.com and you can book a call with me or one of the team. Uh, for those of you that want some more information about the portfolios that Nucleus Wealth offers, uh, a great page to visit is our portfolios page at nucleuswealth.com forward slash portfolios. You can view our tactical core and passive portfolios. Uh, you can see the returns, the fees, and lots of information on how the portfolios are constructed and managed. 
Uh, don't forget to like the video now. And finally, if you know of anyone that might get some value out of today's episode, would appreciate it if you can please share it with them. Also, if you'd like to see some more of our previous episodes and content, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash content. And to stay up to date with news from us, you can also follow us on all major social media. So for myself, Damien, Dave, and the rest of the team at Nucleus Wealth, thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time, and bye for now.